Welcome to the DVD Shelf Movie Reviews, where movies are celebrated, not incinerated. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. Ah, uh, Christmas. Back again for another go-round, I see. Doesn't it feel like we're always doing this, and it's the same thing year after year? The gift buying, the snow shoveling, the get-togethers with the beloved family? This is what Christmas is all about. No matter how old I get, Christmas to me will always mean one thing. Nostalgia. The anxiously awaited Christmas mornings and embarrassing school Christmas pageants are years behind me now, but what I'll always be able to keep are the memories. I'm your host, David Rose, ready to once again dust off the old holiday DVD collection and relive some of my fondest Christmas memories. So I figured I'd go ahead and try something a bit different for this year's Christmas edition of the DVD Shelf Movie Reviews by... Well, first things first. Let's just get rid of movie reviews and replace it with Christmas specials, which means no Christmas story, no Home Alone, and no Die Hard. Today, I'll be settling my movie reviewing down for a long winter's nap to reveal my top 10 must-watch Christmas TV specials. That doesn't rhyme. And with this being a top 10 list, you're probably thinking that I'll be doing the standard countdown, 10 to 1, with the anticipation of my number one choice most likely being a letdown like most top 10 lists out there. But that is where you're wrong, my friends. I'll be revealing each one in the order of their debut, because let's face it, how can you rank The Grinch above or below Charlie Brown? I know I don't have that power. But what I will do is dig a little bit into the backstory behind each one while giving my own thoughts on why these are all holiday must-watches. And of course, this is the DVD shelf after all, so I'll also be unveiling the DVD or Blu-ray and the bonus features for each one of my top 10 choices. This one's for you. The holidays are here, so let's not waste any more time. This is the DVD shelf Christmas specials Christmas special. It's a working title. Looking at the earliest notch in our Christmas special timeline, we begin with the 1964 animated adaptation of... a department store booklet? Ironically, the Christmas icon that would become known as Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was created by a Jewish man, Robert Louis May, and in 1939, while employed as an advertising copywriter for the chain of Montgomery Ward department stores in Chicago, Illinois, he was given the assignment to come up with a new cheerful holiday story that could be published by the store into small booklets and handed out to customers around the holiday season. Much akin to the time-honored Twas the Night Before Christmas poem, May wrote his new story in rhyming stanzas. But what many aren't aware of was that his original story was more than just the lyrics to the now-famous song, even though it is the same basic tale of how a young, ostracized reindeer ends up saving Christmas with his red glowing nose. It wasn't until later that Robert Mays' brother-in-law, songwriter Johnny Marks, condensed the original story and wrote the lyrics and music into the legendary song that we are most familiar with today. In 1949, Marx's musical adaptation was famously recorded by actor and country western singer Gene Autry and became a monster hit, turning Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer into an endearing Christmas fixture. By 1964, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had become a standard Christmas carol, so the brief tale was expanded into an hour-long television special created by famed animation duo Arthur Rankin Jr. and Jules Bass, and first premiered on December 6, 1964 on NBC. Nowadays, the Rankin Bass production team was mainly known for its extensive series of animated holiday-themed specials, whether they were created with stop-motion animation or traditionally hand-drawn. But it was this popular Rudolph adaptation that started it all. Likely considered to be their most famous special, Rudolph greatly expands the original story with creative liberties that have since become as iconic as the song and story themselves. His beak blinks like a blinking beacon. Not only do we have a young Rudolph who is shunned by his peers for being different, but we're also introduced to Hermie, a young elf toy maker in Santa's workshop who dreams of becoming a dentist rather than spending the rest of his days manufacturing toys like the other elves. These two misfits run into each other and embark on an epic adventure where they meet up with characters that, well, have nothing to do with the original story. Like an abominable snowman, a rugged prospector, a band of unwanted toys, and some strange royal lion bird thing. Alright. The special also includes additional songs written by Rudolph's original composer, Johnny Marks, and folk singer Burl Ives is featured as our narrator, Sam the Snowman. 
What's the matter? Haven't you ever seen a talking snowman before? The look and feel of these characters were echoed in the 2003 Will Ferrell comedy, Elf. And I've always liked how the North Pole in that film harkened back to the stop-motion style of this special, which includes an obvious nod to Sam the Snowman. Also, the elves outfits in Rudolph no doubt inspired the look of the elves' garb in the movie as well. This classic special is always easy to find around this time of year, whether sold individually on DVD and Blu-ray, or in a collection with other Rankin-Bass TV favorites. My copy in particular came with the 2004 Original Television Christmas Classics Collection and includes several bonus features, such as a deleted musical number, a trivia game, a Spanish-language audio track, a vintage TV ad, and a completely unnecessary Destiny's Child music video that dates this particular release pretty badly. All in all, the offbeat creative licenses taken to stretch the classic store into an hour-long TV special make it that much more memorable, and they also succeed at further strengthening the moral of the original story, teaching us that it's okay to be different, because the physical deformities you were born with may one day lead to Santa needing your help to guide his sleigh on Christmas Eve. Or something like that. I don't know. I, I never got it. Hmm. Well, it needs work. I have to go. Next up on the Christmas special timeline, we come to the December 9th, 1965 premiere of a quintessential holiday classic that I personally consider to be the benchmark for nearly all Christmas specials that followed. Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown! Funny enough as it is, what would result in the timeless classic A Charlie Brown Christmas originally began as a sticky situation for TV producer and documentary filmmaker Lee Mendelson. In the spring of 1965, Mendelssohn received a call from a New York-based ad agency saying that one of their biggest clients, the Coca-Cola Company, was interested in sponsoring a possible new TV Christmas special. Having collaborated with world-famous cartoonist Charles Schultz on a documentary about Schultz and his lovable creations, Mendelssohn jumped right to the thought of doing a Peanuts-themed special with Schultz. However, he was only given one week to present the final story outline to Coca-Cola. So in a mad panic, Mendelssohn phoned Schultz and gave him the news that in six months they must present a fully animated half-hour-long Peanuts Christmas special, which was no easy task considering that there had never been a Peanuts TV special before. Oh no, we're doomed! During the 1950s, Charles Schultz had worked with animator Bill Melendez on a marketing campaign for the Ford Motor Company featuring many of the Peanuts characters, so he suggested that Melendez be brought on as animator and director of the Christmas special. Attention everyone! Here's our director! After quickly hashing out the cartoon's story and animation layout, Melendez was steadfast on hiring actual children to play the voices for the Peanuts, as opposed to the typical usage of adult actors. The problem was that some of the kids were so young that they couldn't even read yet, so they were fed each of their lines one by one. Then the recorded dialogue would be spliced together later, giving the Peanuts kids their unique, strung-out cadence that has since become a trademark. Please note the size and color of each item and send as many as possible. If it seems too complicated, make it easy on yourself. Just send money. How about 10s and 20s? Lo and behold, a Christmas miracle occurred as the schultz mendelssohn melendez collaboration was able to meet the deadline and a Charlie Brown Christmas first premiered on December 9, 1965. Much to the surprise of the CBS executives who thought the special was shoddily put together and technically flawed, it was a massive critical and commercial hit, going on to receive a Primetime Emmy Award and even a George Foster Peabody Award. Since 1965, not one holiday season has passed without a Charlie Brown Christmas seeing a high-rated primetime telecast. A Charlie Brown Christmas was also the very first in a long line of Peanuts TV specials, not to mention feature films, a TV series, musicals, and even video games. But what is it about the special that has stricken a chord with so many people over the years? Personally, above all else, whether it's the minimalistic art style, the charming dialogue, or the inspirational story, I just love that soundtrack. It isn't truly Christmas without the bouncy and sophisticated compositions of Grammy-winning jazz musician Vince Guaraldi. As a kid, A Charlie Brown Christmas was just a fun watch, with its cast of engaging characters who each brought their own unique personality to the table. But over the years, the more I heard about how impossibly quick this thing was put together, the more I appreciated this remarkable achievement as being a testament to the genius of the simplicity behind Schultz's creations, most notably the Charlie Brown character himself. Nobody sent me a Christmas card today. I almost wish there weren't a holiday season. I know nobody likes me. Why do we have to have a holiday season to emphasize it? 
The sad sack outcast embodies either a part of ourselves or someone we know in our everyday lives. And it's refreshing to see a Christmas story revolve around a character like Charlie, who doesn't really hate Christmas like a Grinch or a Scrooge, but the escalating commercialism of the holiday has just left him depressed. Find the true meaning of Christmas? When money, 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 spectacular, super colossal, neighborhood Christmas lights and display contest, lights and display contest, oh no. My own dog gone commercial, I can't stand it. Oh. And if this was his sentiment way back in the 60s, I can't even imagine how he'd feel today. Great prices. I just wish you could guarantee me they won't be beat. Oh, actually. Then I'd be like, you rule. <laughs> My kids would be like, you rule. And I'd be like, yes, I do rule. <laughs> oh, the rules. Oh, oh, load up the sleigh. This is going to be a great Christmas. <laughs> ring, ding, ding, ring, ding, ding, ring, ring, ring me up. Ugh, I don't blame him. Anyway, you can easily find a Charlie Brown Christmas in several different ways, whether it be on DVD or Blu-ray. And even though the animation is a bit rough around the edges, the Blu-ray makes it look crisper than ever before. It's always cool to go back and watch old school cartoons in a high def format and notice all the little shadows the painted animation cells cast on the backgrounds. On the individual DVD and Blu-ray releases, not only do you get a brief documentary on the making of the special, but you also get the bonus cartoon, it's Christmas Time Again, Charlie Brown, a semi-sequel that was produced in 1992. Additionally, you can also find a Charlie Brown Christmas within the two-disc Peanuts 1960s collection. Moving one more year down the timeline brings us to December 18, 1966, when TV audiences got their first glimpse at an animated adaptation of the beloved Dr. Seuss children's book, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. First published on November 24, 1957, Dr. Theodore Seuss Geisel's brilliant send-up of Twas the Night Before Christmas introduced us to a Bass Ackwards version of Santa Claus whose mission was to steal Christmas presents instead of leaving them. It only took Dr. Seuss about a week to come up with the concept and write the bulk of this story, but it was the ending that he would stew over for several months until he finally got it just right. The profound message the story gives us has had an immense staying power that's lasted over 55 years now, where the despicable old Grinch finally realizes that it's going to take a lot more than stealing presents to kill the Christmas spirit of Whoville's residents. In the mid-60s, Dr. Geisel was approached by his good friend, legendary Looney Tunes animator, Chuck Jones. Geisel and Jones first met during World War II, where they collaborated on a series of military training cartoons featuring the bumbling Private Snafu. Jones, who by this time was working at MGM, had an idea to turn the Grinch into an animated Christmas special, and it didn't take long for Geisel to come aboard. I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. The Grinch was brought to life through the dulcet tones of Frankenstein's monster himself, Boris Karloff, who was also the narrator. Then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue where the little who stockings hung all in a row. These stockings, the Grinch, are the first things to go. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. You really are a heel. You're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. You're a bad banana with a greasy black peel. And providing the deep, booming vocals for the timeless song, You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch, was actor and singer Thurl Ravenscroft, remembered by many to be the voice behind Tony the Tiger for more than 50 years' worth of Frosted Flakes commercials until his death in 2005. There What's so great about How the Grinch Stole Christmas is that it manages to retain the same spirit and poetic writings from the original book, but with Chuck Jones at the helm, he's able to fill out the rest of the half hour with his trademark touches of animated gracefulness and brilliance that has always made classic Looney Tunes cartoons so much fun to watch. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. Jones's direction, along with composer Albert Haig's classic songs with quirky lyrics written by Dr. Seuss himself, built on what was already a masterful blueprint of a story, and being a scant 26 minutes, it surely doesn't overstay its welcome. Unlike... well, you know. Ultimately, you've got to hand it to the one and only Dr. Seuss for taking holiday tropes like Santa Claus and Ebenezer Scrooge, placing them into a blender, and pulling out what has become a Christmas icon we all love to hate. 
The special is of course available on DVD and Blu-ray, but this special edition includes a generous amount of bonus features, including several documentaries about the works of Dr. Seuss, how the book was developed into the cartoon, and the creation of the music, along with a 1994 made-for-cable behind-the-scenes look hosted by the late, great Phil Hartman. Also included are cast and crew biographies, an audio commentary, original pencil sketches, and an option that allows you to skip to your favorite musical number. To put it simply, if you don't own this original holiday classic, then you probably hate Christmas too. Just saying. Now, let's meet up with my next must-watch holiday special, which first premiered on December 7th, 1969. Come on, Frosty. We're all waiting for you. Happy birthday! Frosty the Snowman was a jolly happy soul. With a corn cup pipe and a button nose and two eyes made out of coal. Frosty the Snowman was another production from animation team Arthur Rankin and Jules Bass. Only instead of making it another stop motion feature, they decided this time to create it using a traditional hand-drawn style that was designed by Mad Magazine artist Paul Coker Jr. to give the special an illustrated Christmas card feel. Much like their previous hit special, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Rankin and Bass did a little expanding on the original 1950 hit song, which was also made a big hit when it was recorded by Gene Autry. Created for the TV special was a weaselly magician named Professor Hinkle, who was invited to perform his magic act for a grade school Christmas party, but tosses out his old worthless top hat after none of his tricks pan out correctly. The hat soon finds its way to the head of a freshly built snowman and magically brings him to life. But the conflict soon arises as Frosty begins to feel the effects of a blazing hot sun. Uh-oh. Now the main girl of the group, Karen, ventures with Frosty to make sure he safely gets up to the North Pole as the professor follows closely behind with the intent of stealing back his magic hat. Frosty was voiced by actor and stand-up comedian Jackie Vernon, and this time our narrator was the legendary actor, comedian, and singer Jimmy Durante, whose own rendition of Frosty the Snowman has become a yearly favorite. Frosty became yet another holiday hit that has since run every year on network television. Much like Rudolph, I've always found the liberties taken with the Frosty special as a great way to turn a simple Christmas song into a fun holiday adventure, this one being much more simplified than the hour-long Rudolph special. However, there is a surprisingly emotional little twist where we actually see the melting of Frosty and the impact it has on our main character. Well, that's kind of dark. In all seriousness, for the short amount of time we spend with these characters, this moment is pretty successful and has indeed become one of the most unforgettable emotional beats in the history of holiday specials. It's just a good way to teach your kids about death during this joyous holiday season. Of course, Frosty is available on DVD and Blu-ray, whether individually or in a set with other specials. My copy was packaged with Rudolph in this same 2004 collection and includes as a bonus on the disc the 1992 indirect sequel, Frosty Returns, this one being directed by Peanuts animator Bill Melendez, with Frosty being voiced by John Goodman. And as classic as the original is, Frosty Returns is just kind of meh. Now let's fast forward all the way to 1983 with an Oscar-nominated Christmas special from the House of Mouse. Debuting in the U.S. on December 16, 1983, Mickey's Christmas Carol started out as a short feature that ran in theaters ahead of the re-release of the 1977 animated Disney film The Rescuers, but dating back even further than that. The short film was originally a 1974 Disney record album release that included a handful of musical numbers, all of which were scrapped when it came time to animate the cartoon. I've always found Mickey's Christmas Carol to be a well-made and faithful little adaptation of the Charles Dickens tale that succeeds at covering a lot of ground with its relatively short 26-minute runtime. Ah, humbug. As far back as I can remember, this was probably my first introduction to the original story, and I've loved the Dickens classic ever since in various other iterations. What I like about Mickey's Christmas Carol is that it doesn't try and turn the original story on its head by working in any cheesy modernized humor or self-referential gags. It's just a straight-to-the-point, genuine little retelling that uses an all-star Disney lineup to fill in for the iconic Dickens characters. And the crisp animation is well on par with the same high level of quality that has become synonymous with the famed animation studio. I'd say my fondest childhood memories of watching this come from when it would air on TV, and following it would usually be a behind-the-scenes look at some big movie that was about to be released that holiday season. For instance, when this special aired on CBS in 1993, it was followed by a half-hour behind-the-scenes look at the Nightmare Before Christmas. How cool is that? 
Unfortunately, this special kind of cross-promotion isn't really seen much on TV anymore, but you can find Mickey's Christmas Carol bundled with three bonus holiday-related Disney cartoons on a DVD that's a part of the Walt Disney Animation Collection. Moving on, we're about to travel into the core of late 80s pop culture with an extraterrestrial phenomenon that took our world by storm when he crash-landed here way back in 1986. Alf. Alf? Alf? My name is Alf. Created by puppeteer Paul Fusco, the furry alien life form accidentally crashes his ship into the garage of the Tanners, your typical 80s suburban family. To hide him from the US government, they decide to let Alf move into their home, and as you might guess, all kinds of wacky hijinks and shenanigans ensued for four seasons as TV audiences ate him up. I said no soda pop. It's not soda pop, it's beer. Uh, you're about out of course. <laughs> Toys, trading cards, cartoon spin-offs, Alf was huge. Just ask hardcore hip-hop artist Eminem. He was a fan, and so was I. This show kicked ass back in the day, and even now I still think it's pretty funny. Interesting concept. During the height of Alf's popularity, a special hour-long Christmas episode premiered on December 14th, 1987. In this jam-packed story, the Tanners decide to spend Christmas in a cabin owned by an old friend of the family named George Foley. Alf accidentally gets locked in a truck full of toys that Mr. Foley plans to take to the hospital and give to sick kids. Alf befriends a terminally ill girl named Tiffany, and while disguised as a doctor, he helps a pregnant woman stuck in an elevator deliver her baby. Guy gets around. Sure, the story injects some of that trademark 80s family corniness, but it's the unexpectedly sad story that makes the episode so memorable. And on top of that, the George Foley character was played by character actor Cleavon Little, who's probably best known as the lovable Sheriff Bart from the Mel Brooks classic, Blazing Saddles. But unfortunately, Little died from colon cancer only five years after appearing in Alf's Special Christmas at the relatively young age of 53. The show's bittersweet plot makes Alf's Special Christmas a unique holiday watch for the family and can be found on disc four of the Alf season two box set. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Now, let's only move down the timeline one week later with the December 21st, 1987 premiere of Will Vinton's Claymation Christmas Celebration. Animation director and producer Will Vinton spent the 1970s honing his craft for what he would coin as Claymation by creating an array of ambitious short films and even winning an Oscar for one of them in 1975. As his name got around, Vinton began hiring on additional animation assistants and would later form Will Vinton Productions. Going into the 80s, the popularity of his eye-catching style skyrocketed where he was not only producing his own feature-length films, but his studio's work also showed up in major motion pictures like Disney's Return to Oz in 1985 and Michael Jackson's Moonwalker in 1988. The studio's memorable output in the world of advertising included the strange Domino's pizza mascot known simply as The Noid, and later on, the familiar computer-animated red and yellow M&Ms. But in 1986, the state of California's Raisin Advisory Board hired the Will Vinton Studios to produce quite possibly their most famous creation. California Raisins from the California Vineyards. Don't you know I heard it through the grapevine? Sounds great, doesn't it? Modeled after 60s-era Motown groups, the California Raisins became a brief but hugely popular advertising juggernaut spawning their own lines of merchandising, cartoons, TV specials, and even a hit song with their cover of Marvin Gaye's I Heard It Through the Grapevine. In 1987, the Will Vinton Studios produced a claymation Christmas celebration to run in prime time on CBS, which featured appearances by many characters that appeared in previous Will Vinton productions, most predominantly the California Raisins. The Claymation Christmas Celebration became a pretty decent hit where it was shown for several Christmases after that before fading into obscurity. And talk about nostalgia. I was extremely young when the California Raisins were at their most popular, but I surely remember them and this one-of-a-kind Christmas special. For years, this special was relegated to one of my family's old dust-collecting VHS tapes, and I'd actually forgotten about it for years. The memories came flooding back, though, when I took an all-new look at it after finding this DVD release, which not only includes the Christmas special, but also Will Vinton's Halloween and Easter specials, a gallery of production stills, and an audio commentary on the Christmas special from Will Vinton. 
Watching this special now, it's still beautiful animation to feast your eyes on, and the effort it must have taken to create this stuff is indeed mind-blowing. The Claymation Christmas Celebration was a forgotten favorite of mine that has now become a renewed holiday must-watch on DVD. Oh, and for any other Will Vinton fans out there, this two-disc California Raisins DVD collection was released in 2011 and gathers up two vintage California Raisins TV specials, four classic commercials, and all 13 episodes from the 1989 hand-drawn animated series. Next up, we have one of my personal favorites. A calm, quiet, and subdued little show about a boy and his house. Ah, who am I kidding? It's the Pee-wee's Playhouse Christmas Special, and this wondrous piece of holly jolly zaniness first premiered on December 21st, 1988. Now during the 80s, Pee-wee Herman's popularity knew no bounds. Kids loved him, and adults loved him too. Inspired by kids' TV show hosts of his childhood, comedian Paul Rubens created his off-the-wall man-child character while he was a member of the Los Angeles comedy troupe, The Groundlings, during the late 70s and early 80s. Through Groundlings comedy shows, a popular HBO special, a hit big budget movie, and an ambitious Saturday morning kids show, Pee Wee Herman quickly evolved from a rough comedy sketch act to a mainstream superstar and pop culture icon. Rubens immersed himself into his alter ego so fully that even in his public appearances and guest spots on talk shows, there was no Paul Rubens. There was only Pee Wee Herman. I'd like to finally just say that anybody who I stepped on to get to the top can come down here every day after this and step on me. A year after his 1985 box office smash hit, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Rubens went on to create a wacky CBS Saturday morning kids show that the whole family ended up enjoying. <laughs> While the popularity of Pee-wee's Playhouse was at its peak, a primetime Christmas special was produced that attracted a slew of eclectic guest stars, some the younger folks nowadays probably have never heard of, and other ones that to this day still linger like a wet fart. That's right kids, imagine back to a time when Pee-wee Herman was bigger than Oprah Winfrey. Merry Christmas, Oprah! I'm gonna have to call you back. I have Dinah Shore on the other line. <laughs> Every minute of this thing drips with nostalgia for me, so I grew up taking for granted some, shall we say, interesting moments like singer Grace Jones essentially doing a strip tease to the little drummer boy, or Pee Wee's own interpretation of the Spanish language. Feliz Navidad, that means Merry Christmas in Spanish. Say it, Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Right. Children in Mexico celebrate Christmas by breaking the piñata. You get to break things for Christmas? Pee-wee's Christmas special is a mishmash of just about everything, and boy does it have me coming back every year wanting more. For the past 24 years, I've loved this special to death, and as I grew up, I'd start to catch on to the more adult humor. Da, hey, Mr. Bond, come stand over me. Coming, Flory, darling. Now don't get me wrong, I don't mean adult like it's too dirty for kids or anything. There just might be some jokes and gags that fly over their heads. Oh, yellow snow! <laughs> and come on, who doesn't love Morpheus as Cowboy Curtis? I've always wondered how a serious actor like Lawrence Fishburne has looked back on these days when he played the likable cowpoke. And it saddens me when I surf the web and see that this show is on many people's worst Christmas specials list. So in a way, I fully defend it by saying, of all these specials I've mentioned so far, the Pee Wee's Playhouse Christmas special is near the top of my list. But I don't just say that to defend it. This one has genuinely been a favorite of mine since the initial moment way back in 1988 where my impressionable little mind was first exposed to the bizarre awesomeness that was, and thankfully still is, Pee Wee Herman. You can find this three-time Emmy-nominated special on this DVD that includes two audio commentaries, one by several of the lead performers and the other by a handful of the puppeteers. Merry Christmas, everyone. 
the following year, a certain Christmas special broadcasted on the up-and-coming Fox network that would go on to usher in one of our generation's most influential television shows. Hey, you! What do you think you're doing? Oh. Hey! Hey! Come back here! So, what do you think, kids? Beauty, isn't it? Well, yay, Way to Dad! Go, Dad! Why is there a birdhouse in it? Uh, well, that's an ornament. Up until this point, a crudely drawn dysfunctional family unit had been featured in brief cartoon shorts that acted as commercial bumpers for the hit variety comedy series, The Tracy Ullman Show. The shorts, written by cartoonist Matt Groening, became so popular that this yellow-skinned family was given its own series, which made its debut with the premiere of this special Christmas episode on December 17, 1989. Then on January 14, 1990, The Simpsons officially began its first season, and has obviously been running ever since. This episode, much like the entire first season, has its share of good moments, but overall, it doesn't quite hold up when compared to the brilliance that would come with later seasons. The early shows obviously did something right though, or The Simpsons wouldn't have stuck around for very long. And I'd even go so far as to say that this Christmas episode is probably one of the best from the first season. Dasher. Dancer. Mm -hmm. Francer. Mm -hmm. Nixon. Comet. Mm. Cupid, Donna Dixon, sit down, Simpson. When Homer receives no Christmas bonus this year, he's forced to become a shopping mall Santa Claus to bring in some extra money. Ho, ho, ho! Uh, what is it now, Simpson? Uh, when do we get paid? Not a dime till Christmas Eve. And by the time the episode plays out, we know how they first got their beloved dog, Santa's little helper. Oh, can we keep him, Dad, please? But he's a loser! He's pathetic! He's... A Simpson. The funny Christmassy plot is what gets me to pop in this episode every year, besides the fact that it just makes me nostalgic for classic Simpsons. The episode, entitled Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire, can be found on Disc 1 of The Simpsons Season 1 DVD box set. Hey Santa, what's shaking, man? What's your name, Bart? Nur? Uh, little partner? Well, I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? I'm Charlie Old Saint Nick. Oh yeah? We'll just see about that. So we now come to the final Christmas-themed TV show on our timeline. And surprise, surprise, I'm talking about Batman. Have I got a show for you tonight. It's loaded with surprises, mystery guests, and Christmas cheer. November 13th, 1992 saw the premiere of a special Christmas episode of Batman the Animated Series entitled Christmas with the Joker. In fact, it was one of the earliest produced episodes in the series, and the very first one made that included Robin and the Joker. Jingle bells, Batman smelt, Robin laid an egg. The Batmobile lost the wheel, and the Joker got away! After freshly escaping from Arkham Asylum, the Joker throws his own televised holiday bash. In true Clown Prince fashion, the Joker hijacks the airwaves to make sure the entire city is tuning in to a special Christmas telecast, especially Batman and Robin, so that he can playfully announce each step in his deadly scheme. And now, let's welcome our host, the Clown Prince of Crime, the Joker! Greetings from Gotham City, and welcome to the first annual Christmas with the Joker! Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All the while, Dick Grayson is trying to convince Bruce Wayne to finally sit down and watch the holiday classic It's a Wonderful Life for the very first time. You know, I've never seen that. I could never get past the title. Now just relax, Bruce. You're gonna love It's a Wonderful Life. It's a great movie. It's not relentlessly cheerful, is it? No, it's about how much of a difference one man can make to a city. Sound familiar? I've loved this episode ever since I was a kid, and I think it's because the pacing of the story stands out from your typical episode of the Batman animated series. It's a classic Joker idea, but because of all the Christmas motifs, it comes off a bit more lighthearted. Well, that is if you excuse the kidnapping, bridge bombing, and killer toys. Plus, there's this high level of intensity that runs throughout as the Joker gives Batman and Robin little time to prevent his courses of action. The final Christmas recommendation from your friendly neighborhood Bat fan can be found on Disc 1 of the Animated Series Volume 1 DVD set. 
And for another fun and action-packed holiday-themed episode that's filled to its brim with villains, check out Holiday Nights from the Volume 4 DVD collection. And that about wraps up my top 10 must-watch holiday specials. Now I know what you're thinking. I skipped one or two that you probably feel deserve to be on this list as much if not more so than my own choices. And to that I say, cool, this is my list, get your own. Actually, there are plenty of other Christmas-related shows and movies I love to pop in around this time of year, but by limiting myself to only 10 recommendations, I wanted to stick to ones that were readily available on DVD and or Blu-ray considering that many classic and vintage specials are either not available to own or have since gone out of print and are rare to find. Now I'm sure they're all on YouTube anyway. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit of the backstory behind some of my, and possibly some of your, favorite Christmas television specials. But if you're still unfamiliar with some of these, trust me when I say that they're all worth checking out. Thanks for joining me today in this nostalgic look behind these ghosts of Christmas past. And make sure you tune in this coming new year to HappyDragonPictures.com for more episodes of the DVD Shelf Movie Reviews. So have yourself a safe rest of your holiday, and I'll see you next year. But for now, these are all going back on the DVD Shelf. Hey Pee Wee, what about that special wish? My wish is that there's peace on Earth and that everybody has the very merriest of Christmases and a happy new year! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh.